Hello. Today we're going to uh, discuss the first four chapters of our textbook, which includes introduction to anatomy, followed by a discussion on the cell, tissues, and of course the fourth chapter will be on the skin. Okay. So bear in mind that all these four chapters are important because they lay down the foundation in the study of anatomy. We know that the definition of anatomy is that it's the study of what? Structures. Very good. But what particular structure? Body structures. Which, which whose body? Human body structure. Okay. On the other hand, when you say physiology, you're dealing with what? Function. So, for example, the example I always give you is that, for example, the heart. What does the heart do? What's the function of the heart? It's a muscular pump. What does it pump? Blood. And why do we need to pump the blood? Because it needs to go where? Every single cell in the body, right? And that blood contains what? What is in the blood is important that has to reach every single cell? Oxygen. Oxygen. Transported by the red blood cell, which happens to be in the blood, right? Okay. So, it's therefore important we differentiate anatomy from physiology, but most often than not, they come together. Structure would be useless unless we know the function of that particular body structure or body part that we're studying. Okay, so we need to know, therefore, the differences between the two, but they come together. Now, we know that in the structural organization of the human body, all of us are the same because we are basically made up of what? Chemicals, right? And these chemicals come in the form of what? Atoms, right? Atoms, when they group together, they become what? Molecules, right? See? Example, in the case of the human body, 66% of our body, made, body weight is made up of what? Water, precisely, okay? So chemicals, such as what? Hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and other chemicals, like calcium, right? Okay, we are made of calcium, what else? Sodium, chlorine, right? And so on and so forth. Basic important thing to remember is that the chemicals make us, and as I said, 66% is what? H and two atoms of oxygen form water. Now, why is that important? Very simple. When we have diarrhea, for example, what happens during diarrhea? You lose a lot of water. And as I said, 66% of your body weight is water. Let's say you're 100 pounds. How much of that is water? 66 pounds. So can you imagine if you lose 10 pounds worth of water, will that have, what will be the effect on your weight? Will it go up or will it go down? Right it will go down, right? So there's a reason why when we have nurses, we tell the nurses to monitor what? The weight of the patient. We monitor the intake and the output of the patient. Will that output include urinary output? Will that include the output that is fluid found in the stool? Yes. yes. What about from vomiting? Yes. Very important, therefore, right? Okay, why? Because as we said, 66% of us is made up of water, <coughs> water right? So, <coughs> we form atoms, we form molecules, <coughs> example would be water, <coughs> and when they group together, what do they form? Cells. <coughs> the cells which are the basic structural unit of living organisms, be it plants or animals, right? Okay? So cells are important because they're the ones that are the basic unit of living organisms. <coughs> now when the cells group together, what do they form? Hmm? Tissues. Very good. So a tissue is a group of what? A group of cells. Right? And then when tissues group together, what do they form? Organs. organs. And these organs, as you grow up, go up in the hierarchical organization of living organism, becomes what? Organs. Organ systems, right? And we know the different organ systems. 
And when these organ systems work together as a whole and the body, you form what? The body as a whole, which is us, the entire human being, the body that we have right now, right? So the bottom line, therefore, is that all of us are the same in this room, regardless of the color of your skin, regardless of the color of your hair, of your eyes. We belong to the same species called Homo sapiens. And as such, we have to be aware that all of us are made up of the same chemicals. And particularly, the most important chemical there would be what? Water. As we know, are you familiar with the word water is life? Exactly what it is. You can die in the desert without water within maybe one or two days. Food, you can last for maybe five to seven days. Water, one or two days only. Why? Because that's how good you are. Mostly water, right? So in other words, water is more important than anything else. Is that clear? Now, the reason why we need to know these things, for example, in diarrhea, we lose water, we become dehydrated. From the word dehydrate means to lose water. Hydro means water. <coughs> what would be the nursing intervention and treatment plan for this patient? Are we going to replace the fluid lost? Yeah. Yes, we do. Dr. Gamo will order what? Intravenous solutions, intravenous fluid solutions. Could be in the form of 0.9 saline solution. What is a saline solution or saline solution? It's a combination of what? Water and sodium chloride or salt. Because when you have diarrhea, do you lose electrolytes too? Yes, yes you do, right? So not only do you lose water, but you need to replace the water, but you also need to replace the electrolyte you have to lose when you have diarrhea or luck, we call loose bowel movements. Is that clear, class? Yes. Okay? So, again, it boils down to the fact that if you know your chemistry, your anatomy, then there is a better understanding of what we do for our patients. If we do not replace the fluids and electrolytes, can that patient die? They could, of dehydration. Do you understand? Yes. Now, water, is water found in your blood? Yes or no? Yes. In your blood plasma. You know water is in the form of liquid, uh, the blood is formed of liquid blood, right? It's a form of liquid connective tissue. So if you lose water in your stool, let's say uh, in your body you have six liters of circulating blood volume. What happens if you lose two liters of water in your stool? Will that significantly impact and affect your blood volume? Yes. 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 So we make an approximation, very gross approximation. If you lose two liters, six minus two will give you what? Four. Four liters of blood. So six liters of blood minus two liters of water in the stool, you end up with four liters of water in the body or blood in the body. This blood is water, right? Is that what we mean by the word hypovolemia? Yes. What does hypo mean? Volume. What does vol mean? Volume. Volume of emia means blood. And can you develop hypovolemic tract and die? Yes. Yes. yes, you will. Because in order to sustain life, you need six liters. You already lost two liters. There's always a need to replace that fluid. Do you understand? Yes. Okay. Now, let me ask you this question. Where do you think most of the water will be found? Inside the cell or outside the cell? Outside. Outside the cell. Somebody said outside. Anybody with a different answer? Inside. Anybody who says inside the cell? Okay, raise your hand. If you say outside, who says outside the cell? Okay, I see the hands. I see inside the cell. Okay, raise your hand. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six. We'll say outside again. One, two, three, four, five, six. It's a tie. Six plus six is 12. That means a lot of you did not vote or raise your hand. That means you are in deep S-H-I-T or stool. <laughs> because you cannot make up your mind, right? Who says outside again? Raise your hand. Okay. Who says inside? Who says, I did not raise my hand? Raise your hand now. <laughs> okay, so you did not even just to, to say whether you raise your hand or not, they don't. Okay. 
let me ask you this question. Who needs the water? So you change your mind now? Of course. It's called common sense, right? I was thinking because if there's a burn victim, when they have the shift, it goes to extra sleep, yeah. right? Did I say we have a burn victim no, here? Like, if it shifts and okay. that's bad, then it's going from inside. That's a problem. When you know some knowledge and you apply it to something normal and abnormal, be very careful, okay? Some students, they do that. I'm not saying that you probably took LVN or whatever program you took with your anatomy. Always think of it as a normal anatomy and physiology, right? But come to think of it, who needs the water? The cell or the cell? The cell, right? So it has to be inside the cell, right? In fact, 60 plus percent is intracellular fluid compartment. The rest will be outside the cell, which includes your plasma, anything outside the cell, right? Okay, do you understand class? Okay, so we don't want to go into the details of physiology, okay? I hope you understand that who needs the water? The cell, so it has to be more inside the cell so that the cell can be happy. Don't you want the cell to be happy? The cell has to be provided with enough water, right? Okay, now, with regards to atoms, right? Okay, you have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sodium chloride. Where do you find your calcium? Hmm? Where? The bones. Where else would you find calcium? Aside from the bones. Hmm? Where? Where? Thyroid. Uh, is that a definite answer or you're guessing? It's okay. You can, any answer will be available here. We'll accept any answer. What made you think of calcium in the thyroid gland? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The bone is definitely where your calcium is. What about muscles? Do you need calcium for the muscles to contract? Yes. Yeah. What is in the thyroid gland that's important, that's an element there? In order to form the thyroid hormones. It begins with letter I. It's the stuff that comes from my seafood, right? Mm -hmm. It comes from my seafood. Exactly. Seafood. Yes. The thyroid gland, it needs seafood. What does the seafood contain? That is the what? Yo. What's in the seafood? Iodine. Do you need iodine to produce thyroid hormones? Yes, you do. Who do you think will develop enlargement of the thyroid gland called goiter? It's an abnormal condition, right? Have you ever seen a patient with enlarged thyroid gland called goiter? Due to iodine deficiency, right? Yes. Well, it depends because there is what we call hypothyroid, and non-toxic goiter can be one of them. The word goiter means enlargement of the thyroid gland, right? You can also have a toxic goiter, which means enlargement but high levels of T3, T4 hormones. Okay. Anyway, the bottom line is that iodine deficiency. When you lack iodine in your diet. Can that make the thyroid gland become enlarged? Yes. So what did the WHO do? For those people who live in the mountain, there is no source of seafood there. Where did they put the iodine? To make it, to make it more accessible to them. Salt. Yes? Salt. You're the man. Is there such a thing as iodine salt? Again, man used his head and brain. He said, hey, you know what? You don't have to live near Newport Beach or the Palisades and buy a property which is worth millions. If you live in the mountains, you don't have to go down. You can just go to any store which sells what? Iodized salt. So the WHO or World Health Organization eventually did that in order to prevent the development of what? Goiter among patients. Isn't that amazing? It's very simple. To provide you with iodine, where did you put the iodine? In the salt. Is that man-made or is that man-made? That's man-made. If this were an exam and I ask you, what is the natural source of iodine, what will your answer be? Seafood. Seafood. You understand? Natural source means it comes from the sea. So it's called seafood, right? Okay. So apparently, be careful with the mild camera. Okay. Seafood means it came from the sea. 
your crabs, all things that come to this fish, right? So these are called possible sources of iodine, okay? Now, so the idea therefore is that once we have an atom, how many of you have taken chemistry before? How many of you have not taken chemistry at all, even in high school? <coughs> oh, so there's no high school chemistry in any of some classes, schools? In chemistry, it is very important that we know a little bit of what atoms, right? Because when we are in the field of nursing, we talk about acids, base, we're going to talk about, you know, organic compounds. Organic compounds are substances that contain what? Carbon. And we're going to talk about acids. An acid is a substance that can donate what? A hydrogen ion. For example, HCl. What is HCl class? Hydrochloric acid. Where is that found? Where is that found? It's produced by the stomach. Okay. And what is the purpose of hydrochloric acid in the stomach? What does it do? Huh? Break down the meat we eat. It's a very powerful acid. It's called hydrochloric acid. It's part of what we call chemical digestion. It's produced in the stomach wall. Okay? So again, we need to know a little bit of an atom and molecule. So this is a molecule made up of one atom hydrogen and one atom of chlorine. Do you understand? Okay? So is this an acid? Yes, it is. That's why it's called what? Hydrochloric what? So as we move up and down this tree, chemicals, atoms, and molecules, it cannot be helped that we'll be dealing with water, hydrochloric acid formed in the stomach. Why? Because they are important compounds and substances found in the body. If you have to say a patient has hyperacidity, what does that mean? His stomach is producing a lot of what? Hydrochloric acid. So what do you think with the food we produce, how we give this patient? High in acid or low in acid? Or, now what is the opposite of acidic? Alkaline. Versus acid, right? Okay. So the bot bottom line, therefore, is we don't have to know all about chemistry, but at least some basic chemistry, right? Because we, whether we like it or not, we need to talk about that we are made of atoms and molecules, and these are part of what we call chemical compounds. And we talk about all these in relation to what is found in the body. Of the iodine that's formed in the thyroid hormone, to the calcium that is found in the bone, which helps strengthen the bone, and the calcium that is needed in order for the muscles to what? Contract. To contract. Okay? Do you understand, class? Okay? So we need all that, right? Now, when it comes to cells, we know that there are we are made up of billions of cells, right? And we, and tissues are formed from cells, and tissues, when they group together, they form what? Organs, and organs form organ systems, and body as a whole, right? In the field of anatomy, there are generally two types, microscopic and then what? Microscopic, or what we call gross anatomy. So obviously, the one that requires a microscope would be in microscopic anatomy because it cannot be seen with the naked eye. Under microscopic anatomy, we have what? Cytology. What is cytology? Cytology. Study of cells. See? So cytology, study of cells. What about if you study tissues? So if it's cell, study of cell is what? Okay, what about if I say study of groups of cells? Mm -hmm. Still histology, I just want to let you know, still the answer, right? Because what is a tissue? It's a group of what? Of cells, right? So apparently when we have a group of cells, it's still basically what? tissue, right? In other words, what we're trying to say therefore is that a group of cell is a tissue, and when you study a group of cells, it's still histology, it's still the same thing as studying what? Histology, tissues, and groups of cells are the same thing, right? Now, 
under microscopic or gross anatomy, what is superficial? What do you mean? What does the word superficial mean to you? Yes, anyone? Blue tear. Surface. Surface anatomy. Is it important in the field of nursing? Yes. Yes? Because you do a lot of surface anatomy when you do a physical assessment. Example, if I tell you, fifth intercostal space, left midclavicular line. So what is left midclavicular line? You, okay, everybody palpate your clavicle on the left. Can you palpate the clavicle? Yes. Is that part of what we call surface anatomy? Yes. Can you do that on your actual patient? Yes. Okay, what about fifth intercostal? What does intercostal mean? Between. In between the ribs, the space between the ribs. Like, so first rib and second rib, first space. So just make an approximation. One, two, three, four, five. Okay? Is that fifth intercostal space, left midclavicular line? Can anybody tell me what exactly does that point to? Hmm? Okay. Oh my goodness. Are you an LVN? Are you an LVN too? I can tell. And where is the apex of the heart found? At the bottom portion of the heart or the inferior portion of the heart? Okay, do you know why that apex is important? Yes? Are you raising your hand or are you raising your <laughs> You and elder, you should know this. There is a certain medication that we give our patients wherein you have to check for the apical pulse. Okay, I like these two kids. Uh, not two kids, but two, two men. Huh? What is digoxin for? Uh, decreases decreases contractility of the heart. Decreases or increases? Decreases. Decreases. Oh, increases. Increases. Why? Because it's in give, given to patients with what? Heart failure or heart failure? <laughs> so when the heart is failing, you want to increase what? Contractility, right? So you want to decrease the heart rate because this drug will what? Decrease the heart rate but increase what? Myocardial contractility. I don't want to go into details, but that's what the drug does, right? But Dr. Gamma will tell the nurse, before you give this drug, now remember, this can lower the heart rate. You check for the apical pulse. If the apical, apical pulse is less than 60 bits per minute, defer or hold. That means do not give the drug! Right? If the apical pulse is 50 bits per minute, do you give the drug or not? No. Okay, in order to check for the apical pulse, what are the two things you need to bring with you? A stethoscope. What else? A watch. A watch or a clock that's a second hand, right? Because when you go in, you put what? Where do you put the earpiece of the stethoscope? <coughs> Don't you love anatomy? Where do I put the earpiece? In my ear. A stethoscope has a bell and a diaphragm. You can use the diaphragm, put it on the fifth intercostal space, left midclavicular line, and check for the pulse. In one minute, if it's 50, are you going to give the drug? No. Or you don't. What happens if it's 50? If you give the drug, it might go down to 30. Patient will? Rest in? Permanent rest in or forest? Long. Okay. In other words, you will lose your? <coughs> License, I understand? Okay, is that clear? So checking the apical is important. Now what happens if that woman has a big breast? How can you check for the apical pulse? Okay, like this? <laughs> of course, lift the breast gently and just make an approximation. When one of my class, some students said, because remember the, because like me, I'm flat chested. Can I use the nipple, Dr. Gowan? No. <laughs> Because the nipple can move from left to right depending on the size of the breast. If the nipple is down here, are we going to put a stethoscope here? <laughs> I said, no. It has to be what? Fifth intercostal space, left midclavicular line. If you put a stethoscope here, what do you hear? Heart sounds or bowel sounds? <laughs> and you will tell me, Dr. Gamma, there were no heart sounds. So you were in the wrong place. Anyway, so the bottom line, therefore, is that that's why surface anatomy is very important. Right? What about regional anatomy? Hmm? Regions. Head and neck, anatomy for today. Tomorrow, thoracic anatomy or abdominal pelvic, right? What about if it's systemic anatomy? That's what we do here, right? Next week, we're going to talk about the muscular uh, skeletal system. The next week, we'll talk about the muscular system, then the nervous system, the endocrine system, and then the cardiovascular system. Do you understand? Okay? Now, other forms of anatomy would include your what? Com Have you heard about Com clinical anatomy? What is clinical anatomy? That's what I do. Have you noticed? I already exposed you to clinical sites. 
When you become a nurse, you see patients, you need to know the apical pulse. You have to have a stethoscope. You have to have what? A watch. So if you come to me without the stethoscope and the watch and say, Dr. Gamo, the apical pulse was 80, what do you think will I tell myself? You're lying to me. I'm going to kill you. Oh, I'm going <laughs> to fire you. <laughs> because you did not do it properly, right? Okay, do you understand? Now, so you have clinical anatomy. What else? What about if I do x-rays, CT scan, MRI? What is that called? Radiographic. radiographic anatomy. Do we do a lot of radiographs in medicine? Yes. A patient comes in with difficulty of breathing, one week of productive cough of yellow-green phlegm, and suddenly a few hours before admission develop difficulty of breathing or what we call shortness of breath or dyspnea. Would I recommend doing a chest x-ray? Yes. Why? To see any abnormality. You want to see anything that's wrong with the what? What organ? If you have pneumonia. Oh, uh, hmm? lungs. The lungs, right? I want to see if there will be pneumonic infiltrates, right? The presence of that will confirm my findings. Based on the history, based on my physical exam, I can hear somewhat. Crackles or what we call rust. Do you understand? Okay. Now what else? So I'm radiographic anatomy. What about surgical anatomy? Surgery. In surgery, when the surgeon says McBurney point for appendicitis, that's here in the area where you have the right lower quadrant, right? What about sectional anatomy? When do you do sectional anatomy or cross-sectional anatomy? Hmm? What? CT scan. CT scan, yes. I teach on Friday nights a class for MRI technology students. We show them scans of the brain, the heart, organs, abdominal organs, joints, MRI, and CT scans. Now, in relation to that, remember the different types of planes. What do you call the plane that divides the body into a front and back? Okay. What's another name for a frontal plane? What do you call the plane that divides the body into an equal half left and equal right? Mid sagittal. What about if it's on the side left and right? Power sagittal plane. What about if it's superior and inferior? Yes. Can this be transverse plane? Yes. Can this be transverse plane? Yes. What's another name for transverse plane? Horizontal. Horizontal plane. So when we do a scan, we can tell where the pathology is. Particularly, for example, the stroke patients, we do a scan. We want to know exactly where the site of the lesion would be. We also want to know what kind of strokes. Are you familiar with the word stroke? Somebody who has a problem in the brain's blood circulation. It could be a bleed, which is due to what? An artery that has burst, that due to hypertension, you end up with a hemorrhagic stroke. Or it could be a blood clot in the arteries of the brain called cerebral arteries. And that is a thrombotic stroke if it's formed there. Or it came from the heart, cardioembolic stroke. The idea, therefore, is that our scans help for us diagnostic tests for us in the clinical field. Definitely, it is, because it helps us treat the patients well. Now, let's go to the cavities of the human body. What are the two main cavities? Dorsal and then what? Ventral. Ventral. Dorsal, you have cranial and? Spinal. What is found inside the cranial cavity? <laughs> what is found inside the spinal cavity? Spinal. Ventral cavity, you have what? Thoracic and abdominal, abdominal pelvic cavity. <laughs> what is found in the thoracic cavity? Hmm? Lung and heart. The lung, you have the heart. The heart is inside what particular sub-cavity? Hmm? Is it pericardial or plural? Pericardial. Peri means around that. What about the lung? It's found in what cavity? Plural cavity. Now, remember, when you say vis pericardium and plural, and remember in the abdominal organs called peritoneum, what kind of membranes are these? Hmm? There's serous membrane. And what does serous membrane secrete? Serous fluid. And what is the purpose of the fluid? Lubrication. To increase more friction or reduce friction? Reduce friction. You're like natural KY, right? Every time you inhale, you know, every time I say KY, everybody laughs. The pleural fluid will what? Reduce the friction, lubricate. That's why there is no pain. Every time I heart pumps blood, is there any pain? No. There is none. So what are the two layers? Visceral and parietal pleura for the lung, visceral and parietal pericardium for the heart, and in the case of the abdominal organ, visceral and parietal what? Peritoneum. 
So between the viscera and the parietal pleura is the pleural cavity or space that contains the pleural fluid. What secretes this fluid? The pleura, the membranes, because serous membranes secrete what? Fluid. <coughs> How thick should this fluid be? A piece of paper. Did you watch my video on YouTube? What is the purpose again? Lubrication. Because it's designed to do that, right? <coughs> what happens if there is air, do you expect to find air in the pleural space? No. It's called pneumothorax. How can that happen? A stab wound, a gunshot wound, or even a broken rib. Air can occupy the pleural space, will that make the lung collapse? Yes. Definitely. Are we going to drain that air by inserting a chest tube? Yes, yes we do. What about blood in the pleural cavity? Should there be blood there? No. Only one piece of paper thin, the pleural fluid. Okay. So do you realize how important these subjects are in this chapter on chapter one, an introduction to anatomy? You need to know all the membranes, you need to know about the, uh, as I said, the cavities. Okay, we'll have a short break and we'll continue with the next chapter for our teach back, okay? While doing that,